Well, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't it great to be here this morning? I uh, just want to share this with you that, uh, you know, in light of everything that's happening in the world, God is not surprised. He hasn't been taken by surprise. He isn't uptight. He's got everything under control. Amen? And he told us through Jesus, you know, that these things were going to happen, and they're happening just like he said. Amen? Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 through 33. Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whisper in your ear, what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear you are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my father who is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we come before you in the precious, holy, wonderful name of Jesus this morning, asking you, Lord God, just to move by your Spirit in this place in a mighty way. Touch each and every heart. Minister to every person, Lord God. You know the needs of their hearts, Lord. And I pray that you would speak words, Father, that to them today, even possibly above and beyond what Brother Doug shares. Lord God, anoint him this morning with your Spirit. Father, I pray, Lord, and I pray, Father, for every person that has anything to do with this service, that you would bless them, Father, and guide them, and may it all be done to the glory of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Trina. Be strong in the Lord. And and as I was listening to that, I, I remembered a message I brought some years ago from the book of Joshua. And and and, uh, and I'm not going there today, but in that first chapter of Joshua, Joshua is told by God three times, be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. And and considering and considering the world that we live in today, we need to be strong in the Lord. We can't do this on our own. And when, especially when we consider that the world that we live in is becoming increasingly anti-Christian, anti-God, and anti-anything that is moral and that is right, at least by biblical standards. When we consider all of that, how do we combat that? We got to realize that, uh, you know, the biblical standards are not, doesn't go over well in today's world. You know, when, when the, uh, when the scriptures were written and understand, as we understand scriptures, they're written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Men of God wrote as God had directed them to write. No one asked me what I thought was right or wrong. No one asked me. God didn't ask me what I think the way things should go. But you know, God being infinite in knowledge and infinite in all ways knows what's best. He, he wrote out a, 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 a system of morals and things that we need to adhere to for our own good. The fact is, we look at the world the way it is today, and um, uh, I'm trying to think of how to say this nicely, but I'll just state it. The world's going to hell in a (laughs) handbasket. 
And, 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 and the reason is, is because the world does what is right in their own eyes. And you can look at your newspapers, you can listen to your news sources, and you can easily see what is happening to our world. The crime rate's up, the drug rate is up, uh, uh, the, the, everything that is bad is up. Bob, thank you for what you said earlier. This doesn't surprise God. None of it does. And not only that, God told us this would happen in the end times as we read in the scriptures. But where we're going today, as we've been looking in the book of Daniel, we need to understand that taking a godly stand in this world today to stand for the things of God, to stand for the things that are right in his eyes, you're going to have consequences. Going to have consequences. No one said, no one, let me rephrase that. There are people who have said it. The Bible has never said being a Christian would be easy in a bed of roses. Uh, Because if I remember right, Jesus says to take up your cross Understand the cross was an instrument of, of, of execution by the Romans. He says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Last week, we considered Daniel and his three friends uh, that they were deliberately choosing to honor God, even though where they lived and where they were being educated was in a foreign land and in a pagan land. The key verse from last week was from Daniel 1.8. And and, and the, the first part of that verse says, but Daniel made up his mind like the King James where it says that he has purposed in his heart. He made up his mind that he would not defile himself. He would not go against those things. We talked about that last week. And God honored them for their stand. And and I truly believe that. Young people, listen to me. You know, in school or wherever you're at, you honor God first. You honor God first and foremost. And God will give you to the ability to excel uh, others. And he'll make you shine among others, despite the fact of what they will say against you. You know, they uh, understand Daniel and his friends probably had to put up with a lot of peer pressure because they were doing everything that their friends were not doing. Today, we're going to examine a very familiar story from Daniel chapter 3. About the three Jewish boys, you know the names, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, 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 and as the story goes, we read about Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar, he erects a big idol, a 60 foot idol out in the middle of the desert where everyone can see it for miles around, ordering them to worship it. This was something they could not do. Now, Daniel is not in this story. Why isn't Daniel in this story? Well, Daniel wrote it down, but uh, 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 scholars uh, surmise a lot of things. He was out of town. He was doing other things. He was somehow or another, he was not involved in this story. Uh, the, the circumstances of why he wasn't is not important. But we're focusing on these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they, they take center stage here. Uh, let me rephrase that. What takes center stage is almighty God and what he does in the story. But understand the stand that these three take and and understand they're high officials. They have everything going for them. But worshiping this idol was something they could not do. They drew a line in the sand, if you will. And contrary to everyone else, they had to make a most unpopular stand. That's our sermon title today. Taking the unpopular stand. It doesn't matter what the rest of the world stands for. What will we stand for? And, and, and as everyone was, as everyone was bowing, these three boys were standing. They weren't just taking a unpopular stand. There's a lot of people take stands that are unpopular. But they were taking the stand for God. 
And they were making the clear choice that went against everything, especially against the king. But when we make a stand, it will have consequences. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. We're not covering the whole story, but we're focusing on what the actions of these three. And we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 18. Daniel chapter 3, 8 through 18. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, tiger, pipe, pi- Paul Street and bagpipes and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready... At the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, tiger, palstry, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will be immediately cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the image that you have set up. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, and as we look at this, this timeless story in your word today, Lord, may you open our hearts, our minds, our understanding, uh, because, Lord, this, this, this story speaks to us as much today as it did 2,500 years ago. And, Lord, the circumstances that we are called to bow down and worship the idols of this world, Lord, may we be bold like these three, And say, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Lord, speak to us today. Move among us. May we feel your presence and may Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Key verse in our passage today is I want you to look at that very last verse that we read. Verse 18. Verse 18 says, but even if he does not. And you understand the bold statement there. Uh, there's no question what God can do. God could just snatch him right out of that situation. No question about it. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. Uh, You see, you know, they didn't have any inside track here. They had no reason to assume that God would snatch them out. Now, we know how the story goes. 
But you got to look at them from their point of view. At that point in time, they had no knowledge of what God would. They knew what God could do, but they had no knowledge of what God would do. They had already made a gut decision. They made a gut decision that they would honor God and not worship the golden idol that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, in the New Testament, they got a word for this. They're called, they're called to be a witness. A witness. You see that word witness in the New Testament and in the Greek is the word martyrus. That's, that's where we get the word martyr from. To be a martyr is to be a witness. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Martyrus, martyrs. You shall be my martyrs, if you will. You will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the world. Witnesses indeed. And many will be witnesses through their martyrdom, if you will. Understand, we have martyrs. There are more martyrs today for the name of Jesus than there has ever been in history in times past. More today. We, 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 we don't hear the half of it, what goes on in the Sudan and Chad and Pakistan and a number of other unnamed countries around the world. February 15th, 2017. Seven, 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians were martyred on a beach in Libya in North Africa. Uh, they were beheaded by Islamic State terrorists, ISIS, if you will. ISIS. And, and as reported by a Bishop uh, Demetrios, a chancellor of the Greek Orthodox uh, Church in Chicago, he writes in the Wall Street Journal, and uh, this is uh, coming from the news article, he says that these Coptic Christian hostages were executed for no other reason than their faith in Jesus Christ. As horrible as that situation, that whole episode was, it offered inspiration and testimony to the power of faith. These 21 men executed that day, they were merely itinerant tradesmen working on a construction job. And the executioners demanded that each hostage identify his religious allegiance. And given the opportunity to deny their faith, the Egyptians declared their faith in Jesus as their Lord. Steadfast in their faith, even in the face of evil and certain death, each one was summarily beheaded. Martyrs. But they were also a witness. One man out of the 21 was not from Egypt, but from another unknown African country. And according to uh, a number of sources, this one was not a Christian. He was nothing. Just nothing. But when he saw his companions one by one being beheaded, And they came to him, and the terrorists asked him if he rejected Jesus. He reported, and he said to them, their God is my God. Knowing that he was going to lose his head over it. He could have just as simply said, I have no part of these guys. He said, their God is my God. And as reported, that moment before his death... He became a Christian. He confessed Jesus and uh, and right there in the death. And the ISIS murderers, they were seeking to demoralize Christians with act of slaughter on this Liberian beach. Instead, they stir our wonder at the courage and devotion inspired by God's love. They were a witness to that man who became a Christian before he died. I only have to wonder what the executioners themselves had to think, that without hesitation. There are many, I've talked with others, and uh, there are many who say, 
Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I could stand up to such pressure if they had a knife to my throat and would I confess Jesus. Well, let me assure you of one thing. If you truly belong to God, you claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, His Holy Spirit resides within you, the Spirit at that time and place will give you the courage and the wherewithal to be bold in the day, to be a witness, to be a martyr. Jesus said, as Bob read earlier, Matthew ten twenty eight. Jesus says, don't fear those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather, fear him, that is God, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Our passage today is dealing with so much more than merely not bowing down to an idol. You see, in today's world, we're asked to bow down and worship a great number of things. This is about a king, a government, as represented by King Nebuchadnezzar, wanting to force his desires, his value system on the people. You know, there are many in government, and they've come out and said this, we know what's best for you. Does the government really know what's best for you? I'm not going to go there today, but, uh, uh, you know... <clears throat> I'm not going to go there today. Do they know what's best for you? Daniel 3, verse 1. Let's just go back to the beginning of the chapter. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubics, and the width was 6 cubics. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The value system of the king was set up. It was an image for all to see, and now the plan was going to be enforced. Skip down to verse 6, Daniel 3, 6 says, But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. You see, he was imposing his pagan lifestyle on the entire empire, which was composed of many different peoples and many different cultures. And why is he doing it? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of commentators talk about, well, they're trying to unite the kingdom. They're trying to do this, that, and the other. But uh, that one thing not to miss here, he's doing it because he can. Think about that. He's doing it because he can. He is rich and powerful. He can definitely hurt you if you oppose him. We look at forces in the world today that they clearly and distinctly oppose the clear teaching of scriptures. It's the powerful people of our day who say, you will accept homosexuality. You will accept gay marriages. You will accept transgenderism. You will accept all kinds of immorality, things that the Bible clearly speaks against. Because if you don't, there's a great price to be paid. You'll do it or it will cost you your job, your business, your income, your savings. The rich and powerful today are telling us that if we don't bow down to their altar, they will destroy you. And they have a great number of people all ready. We're talking the United States of America. We're not talking Chad or Sudan. We're talking about those who refuse to turn their business over and to do things to honor things that are clearly against the scriptures and they're taking them down. You know, just simply taking somebody to court will wipe them out financially. <laughs> the court uh, rulings have gone either way. And they're doing it. And there are always those who will point their fingers and make the decisions. You understand how the fingers are being pointed. It's interesting. Over in um, Denver, for instance, they're trying to take down Colorado. They're trying to take down a, a Christian baker. They target this baker. Down the street, there's a Muslim baker. 
Why didn't they target the Muslim baker? The Muslim baker won't do it either. You see, Christians are deliberately being targeted in today's world. It's being targeted. We're to expect it. We're to expect it. Daniel 3, verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans... That was the race of people in Babylon, if you will. Certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. You see, these guys, if we go back to chapter 1, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Nebuchadnezzar was very impressed with them, and he have elevated them. We look at the very end of chapter 2, you know, and he put Daniel on top of everything. And Daniel asked the king, he says, how about my three friends? And he put them in charge of the providence of Babylon. A lot of these Chaldeans were those who jobs were lost, if you will. They're now lower in power. They, they, they have a bone to pick with these Jews, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, and they're after them. They're out for blood here. And, and these Chaldeans reminded the king of his commands. Look at verses 3 through 9. And they responded, that's the Chaldeans, and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O oh, king, live forever. Oh, don't you just love that? You know, that's how you go to the king. You, you butter him up. You say these nice things. O oh, king, live forever. Uh, you, you, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, tiger, and pastry, bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of bar. You know, it wasn't just any death. You weren't just take them out. You're to throw them into the furnace alive. And they reminded the king of that. And, 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 and listen to what else these Chaldeans said. Let's move on to verse 12. And it says, there are certain Jews, you know, anti, uh, sediment has, uh, yeah, what you said, uh, anti Jewism has been around for many, many years. Okay. It's been all the way back to Abraham. And, and we see it here. Uh, and, and we see it in our country today. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in supporting the Jews because God made a promise to Abraham. He says, those who bless you, I will bless. This is God speaking. And those who curse you, I will curse. And I believe in that promise. I believe we need to support the nation of Israel. Uh, I'm not saying that they're right all the time, but we have to support them just for God's blessing. But listen to what they said here. They said, there are certain Jews who you have appointed. Now they're pointing the finger back at uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Whom you have appointed over the administration in the province of Babylon. Namely, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Their words were dripped with sarcasm. It's a little bit like we hear today. You know, what about those Christians? You know, those intolerant, those bigoted Christians? We hear that today. The words are out there today. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I I want you to catch this. They were not singled out because they worshipped Yahweh God. That That wasn't the issue. They were singled out for not doing what the rest of the world was doing. You hear that? They were singled out for not doing what everybody else was doing. I tell you what, when we look at the things in the world today and what the norms are in today's world and and what the world, what everyone else is doing and what we are called to do as Christians, that gap is getting wider and wider and wider. To be a true Christian today means you're going to stand out like a sore thumb. Remember, everybody was bowing. These guys were standing. They were standing out. And today, the Christians today, we're not being accused of being followers of Christ. There's a lot of people who will twist that around. But we're accused of being the radical right-wingers who do not know the truth of the world. The world's truth, you know, the truth about 
love and tolerance as the world defines. I hate that word tolerance because they've twisted that one all around. You know, we're, uh, we're, you see that thing about being tolerant isn't meaning live and let live. It, it, it is, it is means that we have to be fully accepting as valid and normal and as quote, God approved certain deviant lifestyles in the wor- world today that the world, you know, I was talking with someone the other day. Why doesn't some of the things in the Old Testament apply to us? Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the Old Testament that, uh, that applies to us. Things that were an abomination to God in the Old Testament, God doesn't change, are still an abomination today. It doesn't change. But we're told that we must accept as valid and normal as gay marriage, transgenderism. Do you understand uh, with transgenderism and this LBGTQ, I was reading an article the other day, that Q on the LGBTQ for queer stands for over 150 deviant um, conditions to include pedophile there's a there's a work about today even among the psychiatric uh, uh, medical association to make pedophile they're changing the name to minor attracted adults or something like that they're trying to they they give things new names they give it new names but they're trying to normalize it They're trying to normalize it. There are a lot of things that we find that we don't even blink an eye out. We don't blink an eye anymore at someone, at a young lady giving birth out of wedlock. It's not even blinked at. I mean, you you go back 60 years ago, when many of us were young, you know, this is thing that you whispered about, and it happened, but not on the scale today. Today, we don't even blink an eye at it. You know, immorality is just abounding around us. Uh, uh, people shacking up. Uh, uh, that's what we used to call it, shacking up. Uh, unmarried couples living together, if you will. And it's not just young people. We're talking senior citizens shacking up. Why? Because they lose certain Social Security benefits if they get married. And so the government is against, it, it, it works against marriage and things, even among senior citizens. Uh, and, and, and understand, it, it, we don't blink an eye at it anymore. And we won't talk about all the harm that it causes. We won't talk about the crime rates, the diseases, the drug use, and the list goes on and on. But anything that speaks to the contrary, despite what the science says, <laughs> despite what's, uh, uh, what's true in fact, if you speak to the contrary, it will earn you a label of being bigoted, haters, homophobic, narrow-minded, stupid, and intolerant. Don't believe me? Read your papers. I, newspaper this morning. I don't know why we still get it. Actually, I haven't paid the subscription. They keep delivering it to us. But uh, 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 but, but I, I looked at the headlines this morning. They had four full pages talking about how woke people are not accepted in Florida. And, and, and how Florida is so intolerant because we're so right-winged and so on and so forth. It's all in the papers. Watch the newscast. If you stand up for natural marriage in your business, you are taken to court and the government penalizes you and eventually puts you out of business. Soon, teaching God-given biblical values to our children will be considered child abuse. There's a treaty in the United Nations which, praise the Lord, our Senate has not yet approved, not yet approved, Uh, It's been out there for uh, about 10, 15 years. It's just waiting to be ratified by the Senate. But it talks about the rights of children. And part of the rights of children deals with the religious education of children. And taking children to church would be considered child abuse. 
Now, I condense that, and that's Doug's translation just a little bit. But you get into the details of that treaty, and that's what they're telling you. Look it up online. United Nations uh, Treaty on the Rights of Children. Look it up. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. The Chaldeans reminded the king of the penalty for such disobedience to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Look at verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar and said, uh, responded and said to them, is it true? Now he's going to them. They are, they're, they're on the carpet. They're standing in front of Nebuchadnezzar and he's pointing his finger at them. Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image that I have set up. Is it true? The king was full of rage that anyone would dare defy him. We got to understand Nebuchadnezzar, there hasn't been a king quite like him since. This guy had the ultimate and unquestionable power of life and death of everybody who came before him. Unquestioned. If he said off with their heads, their heads were off. No questions asked. No one dared ask the question. And these three dare to defy him. Is it true? You know, if we were ever hauled in court, you've heard this before, if you were ever hauled in court and you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Think about that. Would there be enough evidence to convict you? And the king gave him another chance. Look at verse 15. I just wanted to look at the first part of this verse. Now, if you are ready... And look at what he says. You know, if you would fall down and worship, when you hear the music, if you fall down and worship, great. All's well with the world. We'll go on as before. He says, now, if you are ready, another chance. They gave him another chance to deny their God. Another chance to go along with the politically correct thing to do. Another chance to save themselves. And the king again warned them. It was a bow or burn. There are people who might look at this story and they say, why on earth would these boys risk everything? You've got to remember, they were high officials in the kingdom. They had everything their heart could desire materially wise. You know, they had it made in the shade. And they said, why, uh, just for the sake of a silly old idol, why don't they just bow and go on with their business? Why? You know, there are people who actually think that. Well, I just, I just bow and I go on and no one will know the difference. Why didn't they? I, I believe this was a very definite God moment, if you will. There's a time I believe God was setting them up. I, there's a time that God sets up a, us up and we have to make a clear choice. Regardless of the consequences. Regardless of the consequences. Uh, uh, God does a lot of that in scripture. We, we, we see where God sets them up and they had to make a choice. And many times that choice will be at great, great personal expense. They were faced with a harsh decision at a time when God had stood them up to stand for his righteousness. Now, just think with me for a second. Let's just say they said, okay, king, we'll, we'll bow. We hear the music. They bowed and they go on. I, I really believe God would take them out. They, God would, uh, uh, would, he would quit blessing them. Uh, there's a number. Th- they would have died from something, maybe something else. I don't know. But uh, they would have died in disgrace before God. Remember that thing I told you that was in that movie last week? It keeps coming back to my mind. It was in that movie, uh, uh, God is Not Dead 2, where the school teacher said, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than to stand with the world and be judged by God. 
that 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 was a, that was a turning point in the movie for me. I'm, uh, you, you see, they had to make a choice. Maybe no one would have ever known. They had choices that God gives you. Maybe somebody would never know, but God would know. God would know. Fact is, these three boys were hated, and there were folks who were willing to go to any expense to take them out. And so in verse 17, they answered, If it be so, our God whom we serve are able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he'll deliver us out of your hand. We know God can do anything. We know he can. God is able. No question there. But look at verse 18. And this is the one I want us to key on. But even if he does not, we have no right to presume that God will deliver us. Let it be known to you, O king, we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They had settled it in their minds a long time ago. They didn't make up their mind that not serve them when they were on the carpet before the king. They had decided that. You you know, uh, the good Baptist way is said, hang on, king, Uh, can you give us a minute for us to go pray about this? (laughs) You know, Uh, You know, there's a time for prayer, and there's a time for action. And the fact is, these boys had done prayed about it already. They knew what they were going to do. This decision was already made, and when they appeared before the king, the decision was there. They didn't have to think about it. You know, when all this stuff is going on around you, you're in a fog. It's best to have these decisions already made. Already made. They didn't doubt the power of God to deliver them. They had no right to presume that he would act to deliver them. But where do we dig in our heels? Today, for the most part, right now today, we're merely inconvenienced. But the time is coming, mark my words, I'm not a prophet, I just read the scripture. But the time is coming when they're going to take all of that away. In today's politically correct world, the church itself is worried. You know, we as a church, should we preach against some of these politically charged issues? Because they've already come out and said, you know, if we get involved in politics, and I'm not talking about endorsing candidates here. I'm talking about uh, those that have ungodly policies and everything. And if we preach against it, there's a chance we <clears throat> we might lose our tax-exempt status. The heck with our tax-exempt status. God called me to preach his word. <laughs> And we are to stand for his word and wherever wherever the chips may lay, despite the consequences. And the thing is, you know, uh, even, uh, you know, the story over in Acts, you know, where where uh, Peter and John, they were all before the Sanhedrin and they were talking before them. And they said, we must obey God rather than men. And then that's true. But boy, we go up against the government, we break a law, we need to do so with our eyes wide open, knowing that we are fully in the right, fully in the right in God's eyes, and fully understanding there's consequences to pay. Being a witness, being a martyr, if you will. What do we as Christians speak out against? Abortion? Let me tell you what, abortion is still a red-hot issue. And, and, and let me tell you one thing about abortion. It's not a right, it's murder. Gay marriages, transgenderism, gross immorality, corruption in government. Uh, I was here again, I'm not going here today, but I, I'm seeing corruption in our government that rival what we saw in Indonesia and in Haiti. It's here in America. And the fact is, what is right, what is right from God's standpoint, which should be right from our standpoint, if we have a biblical worldview and we understand what God's word said, we need to understand what is right in our view. The fact is, some things are just plain wrong. That's not Doug Fannin saying it's wrong. It's the word of God saying it's wrong. And I stand on the word of God. 
Isaiah 5, verse 20, you've heard these words. And Isaiah wrote these words uh, about 2,500 years ago, and they apply today. And it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light, light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Aloha, we are here. There are folks who are are clamoring and celebrating the evils in our society today and calling what is good and right bad. It's happening today. This is the world that we live in, even America. And, and, and the separation between the world and true Christianity. I have to mention that too, Christianity, because we have some friends that are progressive Christians. They embrace uh, the going ons of the world. We got, uh, you've heard me preach about this. We got whole denominations that are falling away. Falling, apostasy is the word for it. Uh, uh, True Christians, the difference between us and the world is becoming greater. The fact that we're standing and not bowing is going to make us stand out like a sore thumb. You know how this story ends. You know how how in the story, the, the three, they're bounded up uh, and, and they're thrown into the furnace. But they were walking around. In fact, they found the fourth walking around with them that they said appears like the Son of God. I believe Jesus was right there with them physically. And then and Nebuchadnezzar calls them out. And they walk out, and there's not even the smell of smoke on them. Now, we've been camping. You know, you don't have to sit around a campfire for 10 minutes, and then you smell like smoke for the rest of the week. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. God was able to deliver them. But I don't want you to miss this. God did not save them from the furnace. He saved them through the furnace. Think on that. We're going to be talking about Daniel in the lion's den here in two weeks. God didn't save Daniel from the lion's den. He saved them through the den. You know, Noah and his family, God didn't save them from the flood. He saved them through the flood. I mean, there's example after example. Understand as Christians, there's going to be hard times, but I love that the very last line, not just the last verse, the very last line in Matthew where Jesus says, for lo, I am with you always. We're going to be walked with through the tough times. Now, there's going to be a price to pay. But this is where we are. Uh, uh, understand what did Jesus said. What Bob read earlier. Matthew 10 verse 33. He says, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. We are to proclaim Jesus publicly and boldly. Uh, there's no call for a secret agent Christian anywhere in Scripture. And as I've said before, there's no place in Scripture where we are called, uh, where we're called to be a lone ranger Christian either. This is why it's important for us to gather together. I get strength from you. We strengthen one another. We encourage one another. We're going to make the unpopular stand in the world today. There's a price to pay. There's hard times that are coming. But Jesus gave us the promise that he'll always be with us. We're going to sing a hymn here in a moment. In times like these, you need a Savior. We can't do it by ourselves. Standing for the Lord and the boldness that we stand for the Lord is through the power of his Spirit that resides within us. You know... It takes constant communication with God. It takes time on our knees. It takes time in His Word. This doesn't happen accidentally. It's deliberate on our part. We determine ahead of time how we're going to ha- how we're going to act when the wall closes around us. We choose now 
Not when it's happening. We choose now. But it takes constant communication with him. Where do we stand with the Lord? And there might even be someone here today that doesn't know Jesus, but they know what's right. They know that being with him for eternity, and I've talked about this before. I've talked about this at funerals. You know, when one day when we're with him in glory, it doesn't matter how bad we have it here on earth. For that matter, it doesn't matter how good we have it here on earth. What we have in heaven so far outclasses all of that where it doesn't matter. But our stand for him does matter. Does matter today. Where do you stand for him today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come before you lifting up the name of Jesus. We come before you asking that your spirit empower us to stand boldly for you in a world that is diametrically opposed. Lord, I I pray that... You know, some of us, we need to recommit and we need to, uh, uh, we need to reestablish that connection with you. Lord, there may be some here and there's some online that are listening and Lord, that just needs to make that connection first and come to know Jesus because only through Jesus will we ever come to you, the Father. And Lord, may we boldly confess Jesus before men so that he will confess us before you. Move among us today. Touch us. May Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.